Okay, so this might be the biggest mistake. <laughs> um, I might, I might regret trying to do this. Who knows if this will even see the light of day? <laughs> how, how or how how long it will last? <laughs> I, I'm on this adventure with you. We'll see. We'll see if this was the stupidest thing that I could have ever done. <laughs> So, like, I mean, all I can say is, like, this is what I've been thinking about and wanting to do, so might as well do it. So, like, more than any other game, I would want to come at this game from, like, a historical perspective, almost. Like, the, the, the way I've always thought about, like, let's play quote-unquote something is like that original definition that slow beef described in like that very first video that kind of like like he didn't they, no one fucking invented no one invented the idea of like i'm gonna record me playing a video game um but in that first video he did that like, kind of popularized the concept of quote-unquote let's play it's like he described it as like it's a, a director's commentary for a movie only it's by someone who had nothing to fucking do with the creation of the game. Um, and that's always been, like, the inspiration or the, uh, the, the definition that I've gone with. And, 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 and especially given um, the director's commentary for, like, uh, the Matrix movies. I've talked about this before, but with the Matrix Revolution, uh, the Wachowski siblings... Uh, had like three director's commentaries on there. One was like them talking about it, and then another director's commentary or, or, or like movie commentary track on the disc was like a group of philosophers and like scholars talking about like the themes and the story and the metaphysics of the movie and like the, the deeper meaning behind it. And then the, uh, the third director's commentary on there was, like, a group of film critics who were, like, talking about how, like, bad the cinematography was and the acting and the writing and all that. And I just always thought that was great. I always... <laughs> that's always been, like, the inspiration is... You can do both. You can... You can uh, analyze a piece of art and also appraise the product that was put on the shelf and sold for money, right? You can, like, peel back the layers of, like, what is this piece of art trying to say and what's it trying to accomplish and what's it uh, doing and look at the pieces of this lawnmower and see, like, okay, are these good and do they work when you put them together and, like, are they more than some other parts or are they less? That kind of thing. But more than any other game, I would come at this one from, like, not, not necessarily a position of, like, reverence, but with what I would think of as, like, a more from-the-top-down kind of perspective, I guess. Looking at it in terms of what it, you know... In the year of our Lord, 2020, <laughs> let's look at this game that was released in 1997 and literally changed the fucking world. Uh, and, like, right away, like, you, you think about what we're looking at here. Like, you put the... you take the game out of the box, you take the disc, you put it in your console, you start it up. What's the first thing that happens? Is this rendition this like midi orchestra rendition of prelude and the credits it reminds me of like those old timey movies where like the credits would be at the beginning of the movie like go watch 101 dalmatians it's they do the entire credits at the beginning of the movie and then when the movie's over it's just finn <laughs> like they start with the credits that's i think of another game like, at the time, this would have blown... that. This would have, like, made a statement, almost. Although it does lose points, because Final Fantasy VI kind of already did that. <laughs> Not as soon as you put the game in. Like, this is... You put the disc in, this is what plays. 
uh, Final Fantasy VI, like, you start the game, and then it has that slow walk through the snow with, with the Magitek armor, uh, with the, the credits playing, and this, like, unique, uh, emotional song that's, that's, a, like, more centrally about what Final Fantasy VI is about, whereas this is just the generic Final Fantasy prelude. Like, a really good rendition of it, but it's just the Final Fantasy prelude, whereas Final Fantasy VI had a unique piece of music that was for that game. So it, it loses points because Final Fantasy VI kind of already did this type of thing, and you can argue it did it better, but this was still a big deal at the time. You put the game in the disc and boom, that's what starts. So this is the PlayStation 4 version of it. Um, I'm gonna try and avoid using the things that the PS4 version adds um, for the most part, <laughs> at least on video. Um, I am going to just kind of be quiet during the opening of the game, during a little opening movie, uh, and like let it speak for itself. And then I'm going to spend 10 minutes, hopefully not 10 minutes, but I am going to spend like five minutes talking about it after it's done. So uh, just like try and soak it in. Try and like pay attention to what's happening and then we'll talk about it. Alright, so, <laughs> here's the part where we're gonna stop <laughs> and just talk about what we just saw. So, first of all, keeping in mind that this game came out in 1997, and the last Final Fantasy game that came out was Final Fantasy VI on the Super Nintendo. So put yourself back in that place. <laughs> uh, but, looking at the way this game opens up, I think it's a really good example of, like, visual storytelling. Of, like, telling a story without using words. And, like, cinematic conveyance, that kind of thing. Uh, because, like, it, the best way to understand when and how something does something well is to look at something that tried to do the same thing and fucked it up. 
So look at Final Fantasy 13, for example, which kind of opens the exact same fucking way that Final Fantasy 7 does, but is actually the fucking worst garbage. And think about, like, we're being thrown into this fantasy setting, this Final Fantasy, uh, with absolutely no information whatsoever. We don't know anything about what the fuck is going on. Where we are, who these people are, what's going on, blah blah blah. And it's opening right into a little action scene here with the train. But think about what we've already seen in that opening movie. Think about how it spends like a good minute looking at like the camera showing this like sweeping starscape, looking up into the night sky, looking at stars. Again, for like a good 30 seconds to a minute, that matters. That automatically creates an association in your mind that space or like the astral, like outer fucking space thing <laughs> is going to matter. It's not doing that for no reason. It's very intentionally creating an association between space and what is going to proceed from here. And then it fades from the view of the stars into the, the glow, the green glowing energy, and the face of the young woman, who we don't know yet. So we don't know necessarily what relevance space has, but we know, like, it's in your subconscious already. We don't know what the green energy is, but the fact that it transitioned from a view of the stars to the green energy, like, dust, uh, or, you know, sparks coming out does create an association in your brain. And the fact that we're seeing the character's face framed by that green energy after the transition from the stars into the green energy and seeing that character's face, it creates this association. What is the association between this character, the green energy, and the stars, right? So, you might, again, we don't know anything yet. But already our subconscious is being fed this information that will be relevant later on in the story. And then we pull the camera back and we follow this character walking out of this alley. And two things immediately become noticeable. Which is, this is a Final Fantasy game. Final Fantasy traditionally up until this point in every single game has been a conventional western fantasy setting it has been uh like swords and sorcery kings and castles dungeons and dragons it's been that archetype of fantasy of western medieval fantasy every single one up until this point, even Final Fantasy VI, which pushed the envelope as far as it can go in that kind of setting where it had Magitek, where it was a, a fantasy setting with magic that was going through an industrial revolution. Uh, even, even compared to that, we are seeing a modern urban city with motor vehicles and cars and motorcycles driving by, and huge skyscraper-sized buildings with advertisements and billboards put on them. This is a modern urban city that would be relevant to our society. Like, that's something that we would see, especially particularly, like, this came out in Japan first. It's, a, it's you know, you see, like, a Tokyo-esque type of cosmopolitan metropolis. And then we, the camera pulls back from the lady character that it's been following so far, and she becomes lost in the crowd. We lose track of this character as the camera pulls back into this sweeping city uh, population. And then it pulls out wider and wider to see the full aerial view of this massive, 
massive city, and the scale has been established. We have completely lost sight of the character that the camera had been following up until that point. And, and the sense of scale at, that is being established by how huge this city is has been set in place. Like, this is how big the, the world that we're dealing with is. That any one person, the, the, the drama and the conflict of any one person is microscopic compared to the full wider view. And then it's, it, it, it closes in on the train and we open up uh, into the gameplay with this scene here. With our uh, Lego uh, people. <laughs> so we have control now. Uh, so uh, you're kind of not really supposed to, but you can open up the uh, menu here and, and, and go through the menu and everything. Uh, and like I said, like... The kind of intended idea, most likely, is that you wouldn't be going into this, but you, because it's a video game, you can. So the developers have to accommodate that. Uh, I'm gonna leave all of the menu options and everything uh, unchanged for the most part. A lot of people like messing around with the... Uh, colors of the window. I don't... I, I like I like the default colors. Um, let me do that on initial. You want to switch this to memory if you're doing a lot of grinding. Uh, that's whatever. I always set the ATB on weight because I'm a massive pussy. I'm gonna leave all these... I, 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 for the most part, I leave all the options as default. So, the, uh, the, they have to keep... They have to accommodate for the fact that since this is an interactive game and you can just, you know, the instant you start having control, you can open up the menu. Otherwise, you have this decision of do we not let them open the menu until a certain point? So, they have to account for that. And again, the information that the game is giving you can be found in in, in, in the uh, very kind of unique uh, context of a video game. What is this character that we're looking at here? We see the portrait. This character and that character, like the stylized art representation of the Lego blocks that we've got here. <laughs> and what is the first thing we see next to him? Is X Soldier. Now, we don't know anything about the the universe of the game yet. We don't have any information about the world or anything like that. So we don't necessarily know what soldier means in universe. But the word soldier automatically carries this baggage and assumption on our part as an audience to where we are being given information about, like, he's an ex-soldier. Okay, well, we don't know what soldier means, but we know what soldier means to us. And it's not like they're gonna go like, oh, in this universe, a soldier is like, uh, um, um, like, a, a, a teacher, you know, or something like that. No, it's not gonna do that. Obviously, it's going, it's, it's, uh, intentionally playing on the assumption that we recognize soldier as a military designation. So, he's an ex-soldier. What is all- what is that already telling us about this character? Who we all- who we don't know anything about. And, look at the fact that he starts out at level 6. Most RPGs, conventionally speaking, you would start out at level 1, with no experience whatsoever. The fact that this character is starting out at level 6... ...means... He's already starting with experience. He's an ex-soldier who's at level 6, so already we're being given information about this character. Based on almost absolutely nothing. Also starting out with magic. Keep in mind, this won't come up for a long fucking time, but it's called magic. So even though we're in this modern urban landscape, with an ex-soldier and automobiles and trains and and all that and 
an ex-soldier, did I just say that I'm stupid? Um, we still have magic. So keep that in mind. Starting out with the Buster Sword initial equipment. I always like that designation. Status. I'll get into this more later, but for the most part, the character's stats don't really fucking matter <laughs> in this game. Uh, but like I said, I'll get into that later. Alright. So now we can start playing the game. Uh, interact with the, uh, dead corpses, and we get free potions. Loot the bodies. So we're running forward, and then boom, first battle happens. So if you didn't go into the menu to look at stuff like I did, we're, we're the first battle that is thrown at you, we already see, okay, this is an ex-soldier. So that same information whether you, like, went looking for it or not, is given to us in that first battle. That is, that, the first thing that happens when you walk forward, ex-soldier, and... Oh yeah, well, uh, after this, so... And magic, for example. So, uh, the turn-based combat, I'll get into it more later, but it is kind of what it is. There's not really anything special or unique about it. So, first battle's done. Look at that massive sword. And then, boom. Now now we get the information of, okay, he's level 6. But even more so than that, the first battle gives us enough experience to level up. So, again, that information's being conveyed. This character already has experience. He's starting out the game on the cusp of leveling up. That's how experienced this character that we're playing as already is. So again, you don't have information necessarily, you're not being told anything, but your brain is being fed details. It's being fed information for you to put things together. Like, there's no, like, a lot of, not necessarily a lot of, but you see JRPGs that start out with this big exposition dump or history lesson almost, and it, it like, T Tales of Symphonia, a game I very much enjoy. But that game opens with an exposition dump. It's just literally a classroom of a character telling you this is the setting. This is information about the world. This is a history lesson. So, like, compare that to this, where it's... You're not being told anything, but you are being given information. And, like, this is something that even movies, a lot of movies struggle with, is starting out in media res. It's just, oh, let's start on an action scene for the sake of it starting on an action scene. And then it's like, okay, well, when is the movie gonna start? Thanks for that, right? Whereas in this, we've already been told so much, even though we don't know anything yet. Avalanche, in all caps. <laughs> he was in Soldier. I didn't catch your name. That's because I didn't give it, bitch. So, default name. I'm not gonna change the names to be jokes or anything like that. Although that is a lot of fun. <laughs> We're just gonna do the defaults. Cloud. Cloud, eh? I'm... Well, as you can see, your name is Biggs. I can... I can see that name. <laughs> I don't... I don't... Don't introduce yourself. Your name tag is already on the dialogue box. Aw, oh, what a cool guy. So, no, no, I'm Cloud now. I have a name. Mr. T. <laughs> Press the directional buttons while pressing zero circle to run. 
Okay. Oh, look at that. 1997, people. I don't think I don't think it's worth acknowledging the Oh, well. Um so we're cloud, by the way, right? What's our magic that we start out with? Ice and bolt. There's no rain attack in this. There's no rain magic in this game, so snow and lightning, two things that come from clouds. I'm just I'm you can't see it, but I'm gesturing towards the Final Fantasy remake demo, which had clouds start out with fire, of all fucking things, and pointing out that someone didn't fucking get it. Someone missed the fucking point really hard. Two th snow, lightning, two things that come from clouds, and that's what he starts- it, it's not fucking rocket science, people. And yet, some people apparently can't figure this shit out. Anyway, I don't think it's worth acknowledging the kind of people who would be like, you know, oh, the, the, it's old. All of these graphics are so old. It's, it's 2020. The year of our Lord, 2020, and this looks old to me. Ugh. Right? Like, I don't even know how to respond to that kind of mentality. Like, this game came out in 1997. The last Final Fantasy game that came out was Final Fantasy VI. Compared to Final Fantasy VI, compared to Final Fantasy IV, compared to Secret of Mana, compared to Chrono Trigger, this game looks damn good to me. Compared to when this came out, this blew people's fucking minds. For good reason. If you're so, like, broken mentally that you can't conceive of the idea that time before the time you exist still happened. Like, you know what I mean? Just like, what the fuck are you talking about? Oh, this looks bad now because stuff that was made after it quote-unquote, looks better. That's not even, like, an argue- That's not even an argument. That's not even, like, an opinion that's worth accepting as genuine. That's not a real, like, feeling that you have. You're just an idiot. I do think it's kind of funny that the, uh, models during the battle scenes like that are different from the models that they have just running around the overworld. I guess I don't really understand why they had, like, fully... What's the term? Fully... full The full anatomy of the characters while they're in combat. But when they're in the overworld, they're gonna be like little Lego people. <laughs> I guess I don't really get that. <laughs> but it really grows on you after a while. Like, the Popeye arms. Especially considering how, how they show, like, the cutscenes that happen later in the game. It grows on you. It has its own charm. Okay, so here's the point where the game has to be like, okay, we're gonna actually have to give some exposition. This is the exposition moment. But, it's not... I mean, it makes sense. It is a moment where the character is stopping and saying, here is exposition about the setting and about the plot. But, it does make sense in-universe. It's not just the story stopping dead and giving exposition to the audience. This is, like, an extremist environmentalist terrorist group. Spoiler. Like, Avalanche and Mr. T here are, are an extremist environmentalist terrorist group, eco-terrorists. It makes sense that he would, while on a mission, start preaching, start giving the manifesto that his group is, like, chartered around. So it is natural to have this moment where the character is giving information. Uh, because evidently, the main character we're playing as Cloud is a new entrant into this group. He used to be in Soldier, whatever that may be. 
and he didn't used to be part of Avalanche, which we're being told about what that is, based on how the members of Avalanche are talking on this mission. So it makes sense that the, the leader of this extremist eco-terrorist group would stop and start giving this manifesto <laughs> during the mission. And it's also funny, because Cloud's reaction might be your reaction, or like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't give a shit about your exposition, dude. I'm just here to I'm just here to to beat things up, right? So it is giving the exposition dump, but it makes sense in universe why the characters would be giving that exposition. And it's kind of self-aware to where the main character that the exposition is being given to is reacting negatively to being given that exposition. I also like, so we got Biggs and Wedge. Think of how many people risked our lives just for this code. Many Bothans died to bring us this information. <laughs> the, Star, the Star Wars reference. So we have Barrett as part of the uh, party now, by the way. Uh, and he's level 6 too, but he starts out with less experience than Cloud started out with. Again, telling us Barrett has experience in combat, but Cloud still is more experienced than he is. So, speaking of the graphics, this game, uh... Ooh. <laughs> it's so weird. This game is like an emulated, like, touched-up version of the game. But it still has weird stuttering and hitches occasionally for no reason. This game is kind of a cheat in that it is using, uh, like, I guess the most relevant example would be Re Resident Evil. It is using static pre-rendered backgrounds uh, and having the character models run around what is essentially a completely flat 2D uh environment that just has a bunch of invisible walls set up to make it look, to give it the impression of being the 3D. <laughs> uh. Anyway, let me just walk back into your body. <laughs> Yeah, so look at this environment. It looks 3D, right? But it's not. It's it's just flat. It's 2D. Completely 2D. But it's using a lot of, like, camera tricks to make you think that it's 3D. But it's not. <laughs> eh. Yeah, man. Oh yeah, and speaking of our fantasy archetypes, so we got dude with a giant fucking sword. Sure, that's a thing. It is kind of funny, that dichotomy between uh, this modern urban landscape uh, next to, uh, with, with like automobiles and the enemies we're fighting have guns. And then the main character we're playing as just has a giant fucking fantasy sword. And then the next character we get, Barrett, has a fucking chain gun on his arm like a fucking badass. But yeah, looking at this environment, it's not really 3D, it's just... Like, I don't have the technical knowledge to, like, give accurate definitions, but it is basically just a 2D landscape with, like invisible walls and interactables like if you removed the the graphics i guess the uh the visuals of like that crane in the background or this little water tower that we're walking around it would just look like a flat blank 2d environment with arbitrary barriers and and like what would you call it? Like a, a, a top layer that our model can, like, walk behind 
Stuff like that. And really that kind of thing is emblematic of the technology they had available to them at the time. This is how what they were able to accomplish. They couldn't do... That's the other thing. Like, when people talk about, like, oh, it looks bad compared to modern-day graphics, you're automatic... It, it reminds me of, like, when people talk about, like, the original Pokemon games on the Game Boy Color. Not Game... Not even Game Boy Color. The original Game Boy. Although, I guess you could play it on the Game Boy Color, too. Um... On the original Game Boy, and they talk about like, oh, this game is a buggy mess. These games weren't well made. These games weren't very well put together. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, it's the same mentality of, oh, they faked the moon landing. Obviously, they just took out their smartphones and filmed it on their smartphones. You can't conceive of the notion that time existed before you were born and that technology is not what it used to be. You can't conceive of the notion that, like, no, Pokemon wasn't poorly made, it was very well made, and they just didn't have very good tools compared to what we have nowadays. They made the best possible thing they could, given the resources they had available to them at the time. It's, you can't, you can't appreciate the artistry that went into, and, and that's, that's what bugs, it's like, these people annoy me and they piss me off because they're stupid, but I also pity them because they can't appreciate the beauty and the, the creativity that went into what, what you're seeing because they, all they're seeing is like, oh, uh, it looks old. It looks old, though. Why are they Legos? <laughs> Why are they Lego people? <laughs> like, you can't look at it and, 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 real, and, and realize, like, this... Considering, like, the, can the limited tools they had at the time, what they were able to accomplish is fucking mind-blowing. Imagine painting the Sistine Chapel with a box of Crayola crayons, right? That's the analogy that I would use. Like, at the time, these people, the tools they had, they didn't have the technology that we have today to do what we can today. They had what they had and they did what they could with it. And what they managed to do is fucking outrageous. So, we're coming up to a boss fight, so... <laughs> Go ahead and uh, get prepared for that. And this will be a good time to uh, talk about the uh, turn-based combat. But look at that background, by the way. Look at the... So, they, they did the exposition talking about this is a, a reactor for quote-unquote Mako energy. And we don't really know what that is yet. But, we're at the foundation of the reactor. We're at the foundation of this power plant. And we can see the, the, the uh, design of what's going on. Is there some kind of bullshit going on down there? Um, and it looks, it's the green energy that was in the little sparks coming out of the, uh, the pipes that the character was looking at in that opening animation. So, now we know what that was. We know that that is the Mako energy coming from this reactor and going through to power the city. Uh, so we know that there is an, again, we know that, you don't know that right now, but in the back of your brain, you're being given that association between the Mako energy and that character that we saw in the opening cutscene. That cannot progress past that item without picking it up. So the game is forcing you. To, you cannot get around it, so you have to pick it up. So the game's teaching you, oh, okay, I can pick shit up. <laughs> uh... Watch out. 
What's wrong? Oh, nothing. I'm just having a schizophrenic disassociation episode. It happens. <laughs> What's wrong, Cloud? Are you are you suffering from some kind of complete mental deterioration? <laughs> Here it comes! Yay, giant scorpion robot, because what the fuck? <laughs> so, speaking of the combat, so this is pretty standard ATB turn-based combat that the Final Fantasy series has had since Final Fantasy IV. It's definitely not doing anything new. It's definitely not doing anything unique. It's not pushing boundaries. It's not it's not reinventing the wheel. Right? That's that's really what it comes down to is it's doing exactly the same thing that every other game of its type has been doing up until this point. It's not doing anything new or different. It's not innovating to be sure. Uh but you know, there's it doesn't have to. No one says, like, it's required that you push the envelope and innovate. I, it, you can argue that it's better to do something standard, but do it well. It's better to, like, you know, necessarily speaking, stay on the safe side of things, rather than trying to do something innovative for the sake of innovating. So here's a funny, uh, localization issue. Attack while its tail is up! It's gonna counterattack with its laser. <laughs> so it feels like the game is telling you to counterattack while its tail is up, but it's actually trying to warn you. Attack while its tail is up, and it will counterattack with its laser. So it's trying to tell you, don't attack while its tail is up. Because otherwise this is gonna happen. But the way it's written is like, attack while its tail is up! <laughs> so it's definitely not pushing the boundary, but it's better to do something standard. It's better to do something that's like, you know... Why do something new just for the sake of doing something new when you can do something that's, you know, established and accepted and just do it really well? right? Because sometimes if you do something innovative and do something new, you're gonna end up something that ends up being a total piece of shit cough, Final Fantasy VIII cough, cough. Yeah, so again, take the dichotomy into account. Cloud has the giant sword, Barrett has a fucking gun on his arm. <laughs> and we just beat up and destroyed a giant scorpion robot. Let's get out of here. First things first, we just got a new weapon from Barret, so we're gonna throw that on, and then we get in the fuck out. I mean, like, okay, so I spent all this time talking about, like, all my graphics, right? It is kind of funny that they're, they're, they're little Lego people <laughs> running around uh, with little Popeye arms and stuff like that. I mean, like, that's just silly, right? But that's not a, it's not a negative. That's not like, oh, look, they're, they're fucking Popeye people. Clearly based on the uh, in-battle models that we have here, they could have had them be fully proportioned but for some reason they just didn't want to. Probably because uh, they didn't want to, like, all of the party members, all of the characters that we control, and all of the enemies that you fight have full, fully proportioned models as part of the combat, and all of these, like, special animations as part of the combat, because the combat's important to get that stuff right with. But when it's on the overworld, and it's a little bit more limited, 
I guess they like just didn't want to or didn't have the resources to spend on giving the same proportions to literally every single NPC that you will come across during the game, period. Right? So it's it's like it's like a pragmatism kind of thing where you only have so many resources to expend. So it, when you're thinking about like creative compromises, it probably makes more sense to come up with the little Popeye Lego uh, super chibiified versions of the main characters' models and have those be what kind of runs around in the overworld and then keep the important shit to the giant, F the, the, the big wow factor FMVs and uh, battles. And again, it's something you get used to. It, it is something you have to get used to, I would definitely say. But you do get used to it. And it gives the game a sense of charm. Especially when, when like, we get scenes later on where there are big FMV scenes of the little Lego models running around, like, doing dramatic shit. And it looks really fucking funny. And I do think it is a little bit to the game's benefit, because when the character models are that stylized, it leaves so much more to the imagination. Surely there was no collateral damage for that. <laughs> Blowing up a fucking power plant. We just Chernobyled the fuck out of that power plant. <laughs> well, we just blew up a giant power plant. Let's blow some more shit up. <laughs> I'm starting to think that Avalanche might be pretty bomb happy. Rendezvous. Loveless. Gacked. <laughs> ah, shit. Scoozy. What happened? Uh, nothing. Hey. <laughs> Start macking on this fly, honey, right after a terrorist attack. Fucking score. Where are you going? No, no. You're obligated to me now. Ah. Look at that. Yeah, it's moving. It's part of the background, but it's moving. Oh, that's crazy. That is crazy shit. Yep, so this is... We're walking through the area that was in that opening cutscene now. This is... Apparently she didn't get very far. Or we're supposed to assume like it was happening at the same time or something. I don't fucking know. But we are walking through this urban landscape that we just saw from the bird's eye perspective uh, during the opening cutscene and now we're walking through it with our own character to this very nice music and I it would be re th this I think they just blew up the resolution uh, as part of this re-release but it would be really nice to get like the source quality images 
for these backgrounds because like there's a lot of little details you can see even in this like look at that broken window in the bottom right uh the billboard which is advertising i don't know what cults mount cults it looks like got the fountain here there's a lot of trash Although that's probably just debris from the explosion, now that I think about it. Soldier compared to soldier, right? Soldiers compared to the ex-soldier that was all capitalized. Note that we've been completely healed, by the way, in between that cutscene and us playing the game again. Uh, we have our MP fully maxed out, and our health has been maxed out. You obviously want to fight all of these guys so you can get experience. Is it worth talking about the fact that Cloud, uh, kind of popularized- I don't know if you can necessarily say Cloud popularized it, or he is an example of the popularization of the giant anime fuck you sword. The Buster Sword certainly is iconic, but it is ultimately inspired by Guts and Berserk. The, the the Dragon Slayer from Berserk. Like, that's the OG giant fuck you sword. But in terms of video games, Cloud probably has more influence. Berserk, you know, is hugely influential and popular in Japan. This game is hugely influential and popular, you know, in Western society. It was on the PlayStation... It, it really kicked off the uh, the mainstreamification of video games. So you can definitely see Cloud being much more responsible. Like, you can point to it. Point to him and say, like, yep, giant swords. <laughs> that you can just casually spin around with one hand without breaking your fucking wrist. So pay attention to this scene coming up. Yeah! Yeah! Da, little Lego boy! <laughs> I just love that in like most of the FMVs, they keep those same little chibi proportions. It's like, that is so on purpose. <laughs> like I said, it 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 does <clears throat> I think assist because it leaves so much more to the imagination. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying so hard to be a cool guy. Look at me, I'm so cool. <laughs> Whatever. It's no big scene, just what I always do. Cause I'm a cool guy. I'm too cool for school. Oh, I'm so cool, I don't even have to drink water with ice in it. Cause it's just naturally always cool. Shit. What's coming out of your share? Wake up. Into the camera I go. 
Into the camera I go. Into the camera I go. Face pitch black. Thirsty Jesse taking the opportunity to get to touch the soldier boy. Oh, Jesse, you so thirsty. Is there anything back here? I can never remember. Look at how much you can run around for this one environment you never come back to. 